So good morning, everyone. Again, officially, my name is Janine Wright. I am the K-16 Partnerships Manager here at FEND. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge several of my colleagues on the call, including our director, Hillary Kane. Um, this is a part of our College Success Network webinar series. Um, and I recognize some of you from previous webinars, so thanks for being here again. Um, a ridiculously important topic um, that we should all be aware of. Uh, and so we are uh, fortunate today to have uh, representatives from an organization called the Dream.us, which is the largest scholarship program in the country uh, for undocumented students. We also have representatives from Cabrini College and Rutgers, um, who are member institutions of the Dream.us, um, and they'll talk about the experiences on their campuses. Um, so again, this particular webinar is College and Career Success for Undocumented Students. And I am going to, with that, pass it over to Hayne and Chris uh, from the dream.us to get us started. So again, thank you all for being here. And Hayne and Chris, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Janine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Janine, I got to say you have the most calming, relaxing voice. I feel as though I am on NPR and feel as though I should follow suit in a calm and relaxing voice, although I tend to get a little too excited here. So, <laughs> so, so excited to be here. Thank you so much again uh, to Fend for inviting us. We are so uh, honored to be here. We've also just been very privileged to have a couple of our partner colleges, as Janine mentioned, join us last minute here to share more about the work that they do with not just our scholarship program, but with undocumented students on their campuses. So you'll be hearing from them as well. So everyone's been introducing themselves in the chat, which is so great to see. We I do see uh, we have a lot of college access folks in the room uh, and want to make sure that you all are aware if you're serving undocumented students about our program uh, and also just what you can be doing to better support your undocumented students. So uh, with that, we can jump right into it. A quick overview here of what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, so today we'll share a brief overview of the current state of play with DACA. DACA has been in and out of the news, been very controversial, especially since the 2016 presidential election. Unfortunately, there isn't as much urgency anymore around the question of immigration reform, especially with the midterms now just happening. Uh, and so we'd love to give you an update so you can keep abreast of what's the latest conversation around DACA but really emphasize that we're moving into a post-DACA world. And what does that mean for undocumented students who are currently in high school, who are thinking about pursuing college, and why it's so important for them to be thinking about pursuing their college education now, especially in a time where students and undocumented students are retreating back into the shadows. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about the current state of play there with DACA. My colleague Chris will go into our scholarship program and the current application round that's open and the application process. So every year application, application opens rain or shine November 1st. So he'll walk you through what that application process looks like. If you have students who would be eligible, we highly encourage them to apply. And then we'll hand it off for the campus perspective to our partners at Rutgers University uh, Newark, as well as Cabrini University. I do hope Bryn has joined the call now. Um, so she'll be also, thank you uh, for that confirmation there. So just a heads up, a very quick overview of all of our speakers today here. So you'll see Chris Aviles is our senior program manager at the dream.us. Chris also came to us from Hunter College. We also partner with the CUNY system in New York and has been working with our scholars and our program for a very long time. Uh, we have Maria from Rutgers University, New York, who's the Assistant Director of Undocumented Student Services, also just learned in our pre-meeting that she's one of our alumni and scholarship recipients who has now been, uh, is now working with our students and undocumented students, which is always so beautiful to see. So you'll hear from Maria about what's happening at Rutgers Newark. And then Bryn Campbell from Cabrini University, who just joined us last year, Cabrini University as a new partner college, and is currently the only partner college in Philadelphia uh, in our partner college consortium. And she'll share more about what's happening on the Cabrini campus. 
Okay, so before we jump into the current state of DACA, Jenny mentioned it briefly, I'll emphasize it again. We are the nation's largest college and career success program for undocumented students. We started out in 2014 uh, only really for DACA and TPS students because we naively thought at the time under a different administration that Congress would have acted by now and that our organization would no longer need to exist. Uh, in retrospect, we were very naive. And so, in fact, we were looking to wind down, but in fact have had to scale up over the last nine years. And so we've now to date uh, served about 9,000 students, awarded about 9,000 scholarships. We are now in 21 states and Washington, D.C., and this summer we reached a big milestone, which is 3,000 college graduates across the country. And so uh, we hope to see this number grow. And uh, most importantly, we're now a scholarship program that is open to students without DACA and without TPS, uh, given the fact that DACA was rescinded in 2017. And then please, as we go through this, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll have lots of time for Q&A at the end. And so as we're going through these slides here, if you do have questions, please feel free to start dropping them in the chat. Okay, so where are we with the current state of DACA? I was telling my colleague, Chris, I know this is just so much ugly text on a slide, but I do think it's important to walk through here a more recent timeline of what's been happening with DACA. So where are we? Uh, so since the Trump administration rescinded DACA in 2017, you may have seen uh, the program been in and out of the news. It's been in consistent limbo. So it's been traveling through the federal courts and appeal systems. And then more recently, after it was rescinded in 2017, a New York judge had reinstated DACA in its original form at the end of 2020. So right after the presidential elections, there was a brief moment in time in 2021 where first-time applications were being processed again. So uh, undocumented immigrants who had never been able to apply for DACA since it was rescinded in 20, 2017 were able to apply again for the first time. Uh, but there were incredible backlogs, and so only about 3% of those first-time applications were, were ever processed. And this means it left about 80,000 applications pending uh, without a decision before July of last year, so July of 2021, when a federal Texas judge, Judge Hainan, ruled that DACA is unlawful and again promptly halted all the processing of new applications. So we saw this big surge of students, of young uh, undocumented students who've been waiting to apply for DACA for the program to reopen and only to have it shut again in the July of 2021. So for now, as you may likely know, renewals are being processed. So those with current DACA are able to renew their DACA every two years. Uh, and so since this federal court decision came down in the July of 2021, MALDEF has appealed this decision in the Fifth Court Circuit of Appeals, which is a notorious, notoriously conservative and anti-immigrant court. So what we do know is that since this appeals has gone into place in August of this year, the Department of Homeland Security reissued DACA, and it was following up with a memo that President Biden had had his administration draft up in January of 2021 to fortify DACA. Uh, and this was to address Trump's rescission of the program and also to put the program in its lawful place and address the issues that were being brought to the Supreme Court that was saying that DACA was indeed unlawful. This, however, did not open up the program back to first time applications. And essentially what you need to know is since 2017, only renewals have been allowed to be processed uh, through DHS. So uh, most recently on October 5th of this year, we heard from the Fifth Circuit about the appeal uh, that was put in place to appeal the court decision. And the Fifth Circuit agreed with the federal court 
uh, with Judge Hainan's decision that in fact DACA is unlawful. So they agreed with the decision that was made last summer and upheld that the program is in fact unlawful and they kicked the case back to the Texas judge for further review. So for right now, in some ways there's been a lot of action in the courts, but for the recipients of DACA, in some ways it's been status quo and a constant state of frustration that renewals continue to be uh, applied, that renewals can continue to be applied for, but new applications still remain barred. So in some good news, uh, we do understand that the court has recognized the gravity of reliance, meaning they understand the impact of what the incredible impact would have of withdrawing the program for its current 600,000 recipients. So right now we're about just under 600,000 current DACA recipients, the overwhelming majority of whom are working. So I had mentioned that we had 3,000 graduates in our program. The majority of those students currently do have DACA or TPS and 94% of them are currently working. And so uh, the court did recognize the incredible economic contributions of DACA recipients and the fact that they're contributing to their families, that there's heavy reliance of their families and communities on this program, uh, and the incredible impact we would see in the economy. So uh, there have been a number of think tanks who've been doing analysis of the economic impact of withdrawing DACA overnight. And if we were to have DACA phased out today, we would start seeing a thousand jobs being lost every business day for the next two years. And so this is just, uh, the gravity of it is incredible when you think about the conversations right now at a time when the American workforce is suffering from incredible labor shortages, especially in essential fields like healthcare and education, which also happen to be the top two fields of our students' interest in studies, as well as top two industries of employment for our program graduates. So all of this is to say that despite celebrating our 10-year anniversary of DACA this summer, so this June marked the 10-year anniversary of this program that was first started in 2012, these court decisions are a constant reminder that DACA is a temporary provision that does not provide any pathways to permanent status. Every day our students and their families continue to worry about their livelihood and the precarious nature of their immigration status. So what happens next, you know, essentially we're waiting on decisions is what we're happening, uh, waiting to happen. So we need to wait to see what happens again in the Texas federal court. Uh, we are hearing that it is likely that the case will be kicked back to the Supreme Court, the same thing that happened in November of 2019 where we had a favorable outcome in 2020, where the Supreme Court did rule in favor of DACA. Uh, but we do anticipate that when this gets kicked back to the Supreme Court next year, that the program may not survive. And so our big push right now, especially in the lame duck session that's happening between now and the end of the year, is that Congress must act, especially as we're seeing the results of the midterm elections come in, we're seeing the way Congress is leaning, uh, that we have slim chance of getting anything passed in the next year until 2024. And so now is the time for Congress to act to provide permanent pathways to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. So in the meantime, what can we do as higher ed practitioners, as people in the college access space and working directly with students. One of the things we've been emphasizing is that we must stay informed and educated for our students with DACA and with TPS. This may be obvious information to many of us in this room, but we consistently work with students uh, and also meet individuals who continue to be misinformed and, and misunderstand the rights of our DACA and TPS holders. Uh, so we want to emphasize and let our students know who do have DACA and TPS that they have valid work authorization and social security numbers. They do not need H-1B sponsorships, for example, or any other type of work sponsorship to be gainfully employed, and that your students do not have to disclose their status at any point in the interview or hiring process, and that, in fact, asking about one's immigration status uh, in a hiring process is, is illegal. And so we do continue to hear about cases from our students and our alumni about discrimination they've been experiencing in these processes, something as simple as filling out an internship application form online where they will ask, what is your immigration status is illegal. Uh, and so if you do have students who are experiencing 
such barriers, we encourage all of them, including our own scholars, to reach out to MALDEF, which is the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, they do pro bono work representing students or undocumented immigrants who have been um, discriminated against in the workforce or in any case, and they will take on these cases on our students' behalf. Uh, so again, if you do have uh, current DACA recipients in your midst, one of the best practices we are emphasizing right now because of this pending court decision is to make sure you stay on top of your DACA, make sure it's current. And so uh, there's very little funding for the $495 it costs to renew DACA. It's a big amount of money that students and DACA recipients have to come up with every two years to renew their DACA. Uh, there is one program that we continue to push. It's the Mission Asset Fund. It's a nonprofit organization that will cover half of that $495 renewal fee as a grant and the other half as a zero interest loan. Uh, so we encourage students and DACA recipients to use uh, this, this resource that's available. And then for the dream.us scholars, our scholarship recipients have this full $495 covered. Uh, so we encourage all of our scholarship recipients, we provide that other half as a loan as a grant. We put up the money for the other half so that the student gets the full 495 dollar check made out to them to renew their DACA. Okay, so uh, while we're at this critical point with DACA, again, I want to strongly, strongly, strongly emphasize that we are now in a post-DACA world. The conversation has been very much focused on DACA in the public sphere, uh, but it's very important to note that the majority of our students graduating from high school now who are undocumented will not have DACA and they will never have been eligible for DACA because one of the requirements for DACA is that they must have arrived to this country uh, before 2007. And so this was five years before DACA was announced in 2012, but we are learning from our students, for example, that the majority of our incoming scholars have arrived to the United States after that cutoff date, after that 2007 cutoff date. So even if DACA were to be reinstated today, the majority of students coming out of high school now would never have been even eligible for DACA. So this is why we're pushing that the conversation needs to look beyond DACA, that we need to think about more comprehensive immigration reform and permanent pathways to citizenship for undocumented students. And so this is very evident when we look at the population of students we serve. You can see here now that 60% over half of our 4,000 current scholarship recipients, so we have 4,000 students who are currently enrolled for this academic year, over half have no DACA, have no TPS, meaning they don't have temporary protections from deportation, they do not have work authorization. And this is mainly driven by the fact that if you look here on the right to this yellow table, that 80% of our new cohort, so we welcome 1,200 new students this fall uh, as part of our incoming cohort across the country and 80%, so almost all of them uh, do not have DACA, or do not have TPS. And so we realize we are the nation's largest scholarship program for undocumented students, 9,000 scholarships is a lot, but we also again wanna emphasize that we're the tip of the iceberg. So every year we welcome around 1,200 new students, but every year there are approximately 100,000 undocumented high school students graduating from public high schools every year. Many of them have grown up in the K through 12 system here in the public education systems in the United States. In fact, the average age of arrival of our students to this country is four years old, and this is really the only country they've ever called home. Uh, and so they're looking to go to colleges here and looking to really uh, put down roots with their families and continue contributing to this country. So what does this mean for, for students you may be working with? Uh, we are definitely seeing that students are questioning why they should go to college if I do not have work authorization. For example, if I can't get what we know as a traditional quote unquote job uh, after I graduate from college, why should I even be going? And so we're here to say that now is the time for you regardless of having DACA or not to pursue your college education, particularly because we provide that education for free. So the only reason why we select 
certain colleges that we work with, as we call partner colleges, is to make sure that the students have no out-of-pocket costs for the cost of mandatory tuition and fees. So Chris will talk more about our, our scholarship program, what it offers, uh, but we want to let students know that a college degree is something that can be never taken away from you. It is something that will become incredibly beneficial should Congress choose to act and when they choose to act, that a college degree will help them in adjusting their status. Uh, I myself do not identify as a member of the impacted community, but did come here on an F-1 visa and was on an F-1 visa as an international student for 16 years. Uh, it was an incredibly long journey for me, and I know having that higher ed degree for me uh, has been incredibly helpful in adjusting my status. And so we are encouraging all of our college students and our high school students who are wondering why this might be helpful to them to think about this as an investment opportunity for their long-term goals and that home is here and that they have a strong support system in this program and the partner colleges that we work with that will help them along the way and identify career pathways for them with or without work authorization. Uh, so with that impassioned plea, <laughs> I will hand over the presentation to my colleague, uh, Chris, who will talk more about the actual scholarship and its application process. Thank you so much, Hain. Um, Let's jump right into this. So for the application process, a lot of the things that you would need to know, as hopefully you are promoting and advising um, students to apply for the scholarship. Um, so first we are a scholarship of, 30, of up to $39,000 to go towards tuition, fees, books, and supplies. Um, this is a total amount scholarship for the lifespan of the scholarship itself. It is not like by semester, it's not by year. It is a total amount for the entire time that the student has the scholarship itself. Um, a further breakdown of that is um, roughly 33, up to 33,000 is for tuition and fees, and another up to $6,000 the student can receive stipends to again help with books transportations and other sort of personal expenses that they go through as they're in college um, as hayne mentioned our application round did open last week november 1st this is a um, evergreen date so our application will always open on november 1st of every year and also closes on the following year february 28th um, so please be mindful of that. Let students know that if they are interested in this, they can start applying as of right now. Um, but they have until February 28th, which is a hard deadline for us. And the application um, cycle application will be closed. Um, from that, the awards and um, announcements for the scholarship will come out in late April. So students are notified of whether they have received or not received the scholarship at that time. Um, we do have the link at the bottom for the application program, so I, 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 am, I think we will be sharing these links in the presentations with you guys towards the end of the presentation or, um, or thereafter. Um, can we get to the next slide, Kane, please? All right, so talking a little bit more about the eligibility, right? So we are open to undocumented students with or without DACA. As Hain mentioned, we have had to pivot within the last few years um, and really making sure that we are supporting this community um, and meeting students where they are. So we have gone from a scholarship program that was specifically just for DACA and TPS students to also supporting students who are completely undocumented um, or may have other versions of U visas or asylum cases. Um, in order to, again, sort of broaden the scope and make sure that all these students within these categories are supported. Um, in addition to that, students have to have come to this country before the age of 16 and before the um, date of November 1st, 2017. Um, that is, this is also a moving date for us. Um, so every scholarship round, the 2017 date will, next year will become 2018, 2019 to coincide with the age of high school students would need to have been in the country in order to qualify for in-state tuition in most states. Can we get to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so once the student has um, confirmed that they meet the immigration eligibility, uh, the other pieces of eligibility and criteria for the scholarship program is that they meet the, un, um, they have a significant unmet financial need. Um, and have graduated or will graduate from a New York City high school or GED program with at least a 2.5 GPA or better. 
Um, if the student has been in college already, is currently in college or has been in college and may have stopped out for, for whatever reason, um, they will also need to have um, at least a 2.5 GPA with any college credits earned, um, as well as be eligible for in-state tuition at the partner college they wish to attend. So a, a little more in-depth review of the application process. So you can see um, there's a big exclamation part right on the top. Our application process as of this year has no essays. So this is a wonderful thing. It's a great thing for students. It makes the process so much more streamlined and simple for them to submit. Um, again, no essays for the application process. It is just a form that students need to complete. Um, so it is really straightforward and easy for, easy for students to um, get their applications in. Uh, the form has these four sections or categories. Um, specifically for the populations that we serve, we know that their personal information as it pertains to addresses can be sensitive and um, students may be reluctant to share that information at this point in time. So we do not collect address information. Their personal information is just their email addresses and other contact information so that they can be notified when they received or not received the scholarship or program. Um, they also at this point do have to um, indicate their eligibility, their immigration eligibility requirement, whether they have DACA, TPRs, or some other sort of criteria that fits this um, program. Um, the academic portion of the um, application, the student also needs to list their high school information. Um, if they've already attended college, their college information, GPA, what college did they attend, high school, which high school they attended. And at this time, they're also listing the partner college that they wish to attend and um, use the scholarship for, right? Um, just as a point of clarification, our application does not um, omit the students um, applying to the actual colleges, right? So that is a separate process. All of our partner colleges have their own admissions process, their own application process, which the student usually simultaneously completes um, in order to be able to get into the college itself and separately apply for our scholarship program in order to help pay for that college. Um, the financial information, students need to just list whether they are dependent from their caregiver, their previous caregivers, parents, guardians, um, the household income, how many people in that household are supported by that income, um, and any number of dependents supported by that income who are actually going to be attending college within that next year. Uh, the final section is the responsibilities, and this is a place where students can list um, any volunteer or community service that they have done within this time. Um, and something that you may not see in, in many scholarship applications, home responsibilities, right? Um, so one of the things that we have noted from our scholarships, from our student population is that they are sort of very crucial to their family dynamics. They serve as trans, um, translators for their parents, take, give, um, gatekeepers for sort of the outside world for the home and sort of navigating, um, helping the family navigate those things with landlords and all kinds of other outside entities. Um, they are caregivers for their um, younger siblings, tutors. Um, so these are all skill sets that we really take um, into consideration and into the, the persistence of our students and what, how they want to succeed. Uh, the next portion, um, all students need to upload is a copy of their transcripts, right? Um, so for students who are high school or GED graduates, um, all they need to submit is their official or unofficial high school transcript um, or their GED certification. Um, if the student has already attended college, we will also need a copy of their official or unofficial college transcript indicating any college credits that they have completed, as well as their college GPA. This is a step-by-step -step guide of what the students should be looking at as they're going through the application process. Um, we've kind of already touched on the first two, so they need to make sure that they, they meet the eligibility requirement, both um, immigration and academic um, are completing the actual application form, 
Once they submit the application, they can then monitor the application. There is a three-step process from started to submitted to completed. So they should periodically be attending that in order to um, make sure that their application is going through the process and, reached, and reaches that completed status. Um, and as we mentioned before, uh, notifications do come out in late April. So students should be aware for that and be looking out for an email from the dream.us um, notifying them whether they have received or not received the scholarship. This is super important because there is a response call once students get that email. So students need to accept the award by a deadline. So once they receive that email, letting them know that they've received the scholarship, they will be asked to confirm that they want to receive the scholarship um, by a particular deadline. And if they have not done that, they are in risk of having the scholarship retracted. Um, once they accept the scholarship, then they um, are in the process of um, taking our dream.us pledge. Um, so just a recap of all of that in terms of the timeline, November 1st, our application cycle open, opens every year. Um, we close February 28th. That is a hard deadline. So please make sure that students are submitting before that deadline um, in order to not lose this opportunity. Um, and students are notified of their application status um, in late April. Um, hopefully you guys are taking in this information and, and find some value in sharing this information with your students um, and this opportunity to the students that you're working with and your networks. Um, on our website, we have a promotional toolkit um, for ways in which our partner colleges and any other organizations who want to promote this to their populations can do so. Uh, again, these links will be shared with you. So on our website, on our PC Hub, there is a promotional toolkit with logos, flyers, posters. Um, everything has already been branded for you. All you can do is replicate this. And you have some guidelines in terms of how you can get this out to your populations in order to um, promote this program to your students that you are working with. Um, in addition to that, we also have a promotional toolkit, which um, outlines how other people have been using their social media um, presence um, and other types of platforms in order to promote the scholarship program. Um, a few weeks ago, we actually did a couple of our colleagues, um, Gabby Pacheco and Sadana Singh, held an event where they um, actually outlined all of the scholarship information everything that is new with the scholarship program, um, and again, how to promote the programs for your populations. And you will also get the link to that video recording um, if you want to watch that through and get some more information about how to go through the promotional part of this application process. Um, we, you know, Hayes sort of hit a lot of some of this already, right? We really do see ourselves as more than a monetary scholarship, right? This is not just money that we give to pay your tuition, um, but we really see ourselves as a support network, right? We, we really consider ourselves as a family. Um, a part of that is we do have a Facebook group um, where our over 8,000 students um, are all part of our private um, Facebook group, and I know what you're thinking right now, students are not on Facebook. Our students are. They are on the platform, they're communicating with each other, they're sharing resources with each other. Um, they are um, having conversations, they're engaging with, with us and with themselves on this platform, um, which is a really beautiful thing to see. I think, you know, we've sort of hit a lot about sort of how isolated students can sort of feel with our current political climate. Um, so this is a great space for them to see that they're not alone, that other students are experiencing um, very similar um, obstacles across the country um, and really sort of engage in a discourse where they are supported with each other and with us. Um, I actually attended a presentation that um, our president Candy Marshall held yesterday um, and which she spoke to this where, um, when the Trump administration was elected, there was a, there was a considerable amount of fear of deportation. Um, and a pregnant, um, a mother scholar of us 
sort of posted on the Facebook page um, her fears or, or sort of thinking around the process of having her family separated if she was to be deported um, because her children were citizens, they were born here. Um, and immediately other mothers who are also scholars in the program started to pour out and sort of talk about their processes and different support programs that they're looking at. Um, so it's really a sort of safe space for students to share information like this and really connect. Um, in addition to that, we have adopted a, a partner college model, as Hain has mentioned, um, partnering with 80 plus colleges across the country, where we are able to um, leverage in some on the ground work and really have um, people working with our scholars to provide support networks. Um, this has really made it um, possible to provide affordable college education for our students, address barriers and challenges facing undocumented students, both at a macro level and on the ground level, um, and reach our goal of 75% graduation within a 150% time. Um, due to our collaborative efforts with our PCs and supporting students and helping them navigate the process, our scholars are, um, superseding all national benchmarks. Uh, we have a 92% first year persistent rate, 82% overall rate, and a 3.3 average GPA for our scholars across the country. Um, and again, this is a collaborative effort in which we are working with our partner colleges to make sure that our students are succeeding. And I think that is a pretty good segue to introducing our next guest speaker, from our partner colleges at um, Rutgers, uh, Maria. Hi everyone, um, can anyone see my screen? Good, perfect. Um, my name is Maria Zamora, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am currently the Assistant Director for Undocumented Student Services at Rutgers University, Newark. Uh, I myself am a Dream.us alumni. I am a proud DACA recipient, and I'm very glad about the work that I do. I'm very proud of it, um, especially where we have where we started at Rutgers and now where we are. Um, so with Dream.us scholars, um, the, one of the first things after they get admitted, they will meet with their Dream.us liaison. And from there, they will create an action plan as to what they wanna see their two or four years of that where they are in the university. Um, and well, one of the action plans is, are they eligible for in-state tuition, which they probably are because they're Dream.us scholars. Um, so what they're going to do is sign that affidavit with the university and revert their out-of-state to in-state tuition. So after that, after they apply to New Jersey Alternative Aid application um, and meet with their financial aid, um, financial aid counselor, they will see their package and they will talk about what that would look like dispersed through all um, two semesters or all four semesters that they're there with the Dream.us and Rutgers University. So the thing after, you know, you're all set with admissions, you're all set with financial aid, and as an undocumented student, you have all that and you're saying, okay, I'm fine, but what afterwards? How do I navigate college as an undocumented student? And that's where my, my office comes in. Um, so we do case management. I meet with all the Dream.us scholars and non-Dream.us um, scholars. So DOC recipients, um, DOC, uh, TPS, asylum seekers. I meet with anybody who wants to seek services. So I help them with the process of admissions all the way to career development. Um, and right now, that's what I'm seeing with a lot of my students. The majority of my freshmen and my sophomores do not have a work permit. Um, so they come very disappointed, very frustrated. And that's where I really do try to tell them, like, this is not the end of everything. You can graduate and you can use all of the resources around you, your skills to become, to become an entrepreneur or um, create your, uh, uh, to start freelancing. Um, and everything could change later on if there's a legislation that passes or your immigration status changes, um, but not to give up. Um, so we definitely focus with the career development portion a significant amount, um, just because there are so many of our students that do not have work permits. 
Um, then we do referrals to different types of resources. So if, for housing insecurity, for food insecurity, we help our undocumented students if they're facing any of that. Uh, the third one will be for our Undocu Ambassador, our peer-to-peer -peer mentor program. We have a lot of Dream.us scholars that are our peer mentors um, within the Undocu Ambassador. They uh, help younger Undocu students come in and they help them with picking out their classes, what teachers, what professors to pick, uh, what's the best food. As small things really do make a difference when you don't know someone on campus, when you don't know the student life. A portion on campus. So um, there's a lot of things that go on in undocumented life, right? And the last thing we want our students is to solely think about their immigration status. We want them to be students. We want them to have a social life. So the peer-to-peer -peer mentorship really does help because they don't have to explain to their mentor what it means to be undocumented and what it means to be an undocumented student. They already have done it. Uh, immigration clinics use, comes up a lot. A lot of our students need uh, a lawyer to speak to, and we offer free legal services to all of all of our students, no matter their immigration status. And we also support with the DACA fees. We actually support with all immigration fees up to a five hundred dollar credit, um, just because most of our um, individuals who do apply for this fees for a DACA. And then the last one is our Dreamers Lounge. I'm actually sitting in it right now. It's currently not open, but it's a space dedicated for our undocumented students uh, and allies. And it'll open up this uh, January and it's going to be great. Hopefully a lot of the students use it. We have around 200 undocumented students. Um, we're one of the largest um, institutions that hold undocumented students. So we're really proud of the space, especially where we started in 2017 where we had no one. Um, and now we have an entire space dedicated to support DACA recipients, Dream.us scholars and individuals from mixed status families. And I know that there's a, a lot of people in, in this space right now from institutions or from um, uh, scholarship partners, but one of the things that I think it's very special for our students is the graduation portion, um, just because not everybody gets it to gets to graduation, especially because of their immigration status. So to see our undocumented students, to see our Dream.us scholars be celebrated by their peers, be celebrated by an administration, and giving a space dedicated to do this is it's one of the most special moments. Um, on the right, you'll see that that particular student right there is a former Dream.us scholar. Um, not everyone here is from the Dream.us, but we don't want to separate both. We definitely want to. Include everybody. Uh, so this is every every May we we do a celebration. We we spend a ridiculous amount of money, but we want us to we want them to feel special. Um, and they get stoles and they say Dreamer on it, as well as they, they get the Dream.us stoles as well. So this is one of the, the the portions that we really want for institutions that do partner up with the Dream.us to uh, start doing is to have an undocu graduation. The point of the scholarship is for them to uh, go to school, uh, retain, and then graduate. So this is this is a big um, uh, portion that I, I would encourage individuals to do. Uh, this is my contact information. I would love to, to reach out or um, speak with individuals who have more questions. Uh, you can follow us on social media. We definitely post a lot there to talk about updates on DACA, things that we're doing at Rutgers, uh, and then answering questions too. So thank you so much, and I will pass it to uh, my colleague, Brent. There we go. Good morning, everyone. I do not have slides this morning. Um, between technical issues uh, and a few other things around here today, there's no slides. So you get just me today, but I will be putting my contact information in um, the chat for you all so that you can reach out with any questions as we kind of go through. What I loved is that um, to listen to Maria talk about where they are several years down the line as a partner college is where we're going. So, um, let me back up. My name is Bryn Campbell. I serve as the Director of Undergraduate Admissions here at Cabrini University. We are just 12 miles outside of uh, the city of Philadelphia. And we, uh, my pronouns are she and her. So I wanted to give you kind of a quick rundown. And I think you're going to hear very similar philosophy and style to what Maria spoke about. So um, let, me, let me give you kind of the rundown here. 
So Cabrini University is a Catholic institution. Uh, we were founded in 1957 under our namesake, Mother Cabrini. Mother Cabrini is the patron saint of um, immigration and hospital administration. Um, as a young immigrant woman herself, she came here from Italy in the late 1800s and spoke only Italian. She was able to amass a wealth that rivaled the Rockefellers of the time. And with that wealth, she built 67 orphanages, colleges, and um, hospitals for uh, people across, mostly in the U.S., but in other countries as well. Uh, she also lived to the age of 67. And so we think that that is really symbolic. And what we try to do is live out her mission. And so our partnership with Dream.us is really that next step. We have always been considered to be an undocumented friendly school, but now we really have the pieces to help us back that um, by having this amazing organization as our partner. Some other statistics that I don't think anybody truly realizes about Cabrini, and we're still trying to get that out there for others, is that our student population last year's incoming class, 57% were students of color or BIPOC students. Um, overall, as a university, we're at 38% this year, so that is going to be increasing. We're very proud of that. And last year's incoming class had 54% were first-generation students here on campus. So last year was officially our first year as a Dream.us partner. And as such, uh, we get to launch our first application um, with them and really get through this process. I have I'll joked that this is uh, I have joked that this has been a bit of a slow moving train for us getting started and getting up and running and really uh, being able to get moving. And so we really feel like we have our feet under us this year. And so I really enjoyed actually hearing Maria's comments because I was taking notes and some of the amazing things you're doing so that we can continue that. And I think that that in and of itself is probably a great example of why being part of this organization is so wonderful. We get to hear from each other and pick and choose ideas and share concepts because we're all in this together for the success of these students. And we want to make sure that they are comfortable, they are loved, and that they are then also getting the education so they can move forward as well. So um, we're, I like to dub our program. This has not caught on on campus, but I'm really working on it. And I say this to Hayne and Chris, I'm really trying to get this to catch on from app to cap. So from application to Cabrini, application to the dream.us, but to cap, that graduation cap at the very end. And anything beyond that, um, our doors are always open to our graduates uh, as they want or might need career services down the line as well, um, or just that connection back to the university. And so um, we're really, like I said, launching it as an actual full program and getting it named and that kind of thing. That's where we are now. But I'm not the only person that's involved. I just was the lucky one to be invited today. We have an entire team here at Cabrini University that is driven towards making sure the students are successful. And so that team includes um, persons on our career uh, and our Center for Career and Professional Development team. Um, we have a dedicated person in our advising team. Um, we have a dedicated person on financial aid. We have a dedicated person in admissions. But overseeing all of us, and this is a relatively new appointment, is um, Dr. Nune Gregorian, who is the a professor here on campus, but she also is the director for our Center on Immigration here on campus. And that connection has been incredible already. She immediately jumped in and said, I hear the work that we're doing. How can I help? And then we said, well, we could really use a great leader like you. And she said, I'm in, let's do this. And so she's currently building out programming year round. Right now we have monthly plans for this year, but we are working on, of course, future years. Again, this is our first class in, so we're very excited. Um, and she's also a great resource to our students when they have questions about immigration status or next steps um, and what might be the best for them and potentially for their families. Uh, she is an invaluable resource to us and to our students. And so we really are working to make sure that we are serving students from every angle. Um, so, you know, in addition to all of those pieces, one of the other pieces is actually housing and food. So we do have an extensive food pantry here on campus for students who may need it. That's open to all students. But we are actually working now with our financial aid office and our financial aid modeling um, to see how we might be able to subsidize housing and or food costs for students who need that as well. Um, we recognize that every student is coming to us with a different set of circumstances. And so we want to try to meet everyone where they are. It's something we've been really good at and it's something we're looking to improve, especially when it comes to our undocumented students. 
And so that is something that um, we are working extensively on and I'm hoping for some good news in the next few weeks for future students coming to campus as well. Um, I think that covers probably the big pieces about us and how we work. Again, we're so new to this that I don't even have the four-year plan, but I'm absolutely stealing some of Maria's ideas because they are incredible, and I just appreciate the work that she is doing on her campus. Um, and again, I'll throw my contact information here into the chat. I would love to talk with any and all of you. We do serve students from the state of Pennsylvania. We also can serve students from Newcastle County in Delaware. So any students that you might know that are graduating in Newcastle County, Delaware, they can apply for for us as well. Um, and so just wanted to share that last little piece because that is a new addition for us this year. Thank you, Bryn. And thank you, Maria and Chris. And hey, this is just really, really good information. And I know that it's appreciated. Uh, we do have some questions. So I want to get to a few of those as well. Um, 